Okay, salam alaikum everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, our uh, Arshi series. Uh, uh, we uh, will be starting in a minute. Uh, today's um, um, host of this session is Dr. Reem from Kuwait and our speaker is Dr. Ali Hajir. Um, without further ado, I ask, uh, remind everybody to please uh, mute yourself and turn off your cameras. Uh, except for the speaker. Um, and without further ado, Dr. Reem, take it, please. Yeah. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Professor Ali Hajir. He is a graduate from Yermuk University and Manchester University, and he holds both uh, British and American boards of histocompatibility and immunogenetics. Uh, Professor Ali is uh, the head of immunopathology at King's Abdelaziz Medical Area City in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, and he is also a co-founder of the Arshi Group, or Archie, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, he is also an author of more than 200 peer-reviewed articles. His lab in Riyadh was among the first few labs um, uh, in to introduce the next generation sequencing in LGLA typing uh, worldwide. Dr. Uh, Ali, please, um, you can start your talk, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to start by thanking my uh, colleagues, Dr. Uh, uh, Din Berka and Dr. Reem Amin uh, for the nice introduction. I would like to thank Arshi as a society, especially uh, Mr. Fadi as Zair, Dr. Dunya Jamdet, uh, for uh, organizing this uh, series of lectures. Uh, I would like to start uh, first by uh, saying a couple of words about uh, Lebanon and uh, what happened there in terms of the economic crisis and uh, the effect on uh, uh, cancer patients uh, receiving stem cell transplant. Uh, they were in need of HLA typing kits and they couldn't buy any and uh, their uh, stem cell program actually was on hold. Many people volunteered to help, I would like to thank all those who volunteered to help. Just a word of thank you to everyone. Uh, let's start. Uh, my uh, lecture today is about common intermediate, well-documented HLA LAs in the Saudi population, uh, solutions for ambiguous typing. First of all, I declare no conflict of interest whatso whatsoever, and uh, there's nothing to declare as part of this lecture. <clears throat> As we all know, uh, NGS typing is allowing us to discover new alleles every day. I believe every single day there are new alleles deposited in the uh, WHO uh, committee uh, database. And as you can see, the number of alleles we discover is growing, especially for class one and for class two, but the numbers for class one are much, much higher than those for class two. And, and this slide just summarizes number of alleles as of uh, September 2020 for HLA-A, for example, more than 6,000 alleles. In terms of proteins, there are about, just about 4,000, almost 4,000 alleles. HLA-B is the most polymorphic gene locus in the HLA region, and we have more than 7,000 alleles almost 5,000 proteins. Same for HLA-C. Null alleles, as you can see, they are very few for all class one. And when it comes to class two, you see a little bit of sort of um, more numbers of null alleles for DRB1. Uh, however, the number of alleles for DR is, is the highest in the class two, almost 3,500, uh, with almost 2,500 proteins for DRB1. DQA is less polymorphic. DQB and then DPB, we have about 17 or uh, 1,600 uh, alleles for DPP1. So these alleles are being discovered every day. And people sometimes say, well, is this allele seen only in your population? If it was discovered in Saudi Arabia or in the States or in South Africa or in Australia, uh, is this seen somewhere else? 
So what Ashi uh, group did, uh, they uh, sort of organized a, a committee to look at uh, common and well-documented alleles. And it was published by international histocompatibility genetics researchers. And they identified HLA alleles with the frequencies that are well known or have been identified in multiple times. That was sort of a first attempt at looking at sequence-based uh, uh, typing and uh, trying to recognize those alleles that are common in the different populations. And that was sort of the first trial or, or first attempt, which was carried out by ASHI. And it was in 2007. That was the first catalog of common well documented alleles. That was followed then by another update in 2012, and it was called Virgin 2. Uh, published in tissue antigens, again replicated uh, this uh, 2012 by ASHI, it was replicated by IFI as the common well documented alleles published 2017. And the Chinese um, uh, Maru donor program tried to uh, replicate that uh, analysis and they published their data in 2018. <coughs> Recently, a group uh, led by Caroline Hurley and uh, Jason then, they sort of talked to different uh, registries around the world and uh, they connected people together, putting together one of the largest and a group of donors uh, worldwide uh, with almost uh, 8 million people in that analysis. Uh, we were lucky. Uh, our our registry and dreams registry from Kuwait to be involved in, in that analysis. So 20 registries submitted their data with uh, typing on HLA A, B, C, DRB1, DRB345, DQB1, and DPB1. Uh, the population from these 20 registries were divided into different groups, seven groups, Africans and African Americans, Asian and Pacific Islands, Europeans, descent, MENA where we fit, and that includes uh, the Middle East, North Coast of Africa, HEST, which is South and Central America, Hispanic, Latino, and then Native Americans, and unknown, where people did not sort of take the, the ethnicity when they uh, registered as donors, or if there were multiple ancestries in, in, in this, uh, in the donor uh, sort of identification. These were the 20 registries from different parts of the world. As I said, from the Arab world, uh, uh, Reem in Kuwait and ourselves, uh, uh, me and Dr. Dunya and Dr. Askar and Dr. Uh, uh, Mahsin Zahrani, who were part of that paper, uh, we contributed 34,000 uh, donors. And in total, there were about 8 million donors in that paper. Just to give you a brief intro production about what is the difference between common well documented catalog two versus common well and intermediate documented alleles uh, catalog three. Uh, for uh, uh, catalog two, the common alleles were defined as being detected in more than one in a thousand individuals. In other words, to do that sort of analysis, you need at least 2,000 people. For common, uh, for catalog three, you need more than or equal to one in 10,000. In other words, to do that analysis, you must have at least, at least 10,000 individuals. Sorry, 10,000 at least, which is 5,000 individuals. To be able to, uh, in, uh, intermediate category was not included in uh, version two, but it was in version three. And that was one in, ten, in 100,000. In other words, you need 50,000, at least 50,000 individuals to be able to look at that category in terms of intermediate uh, uh, alleles. Well documented for both catalog two and three, you need to have them more than five observations. Not common, not common uh, well and intermediate was not listed in two, but it is observed in catalog three and it is usually one to four individuals. Sorry, one to four allele counts. So the data from catalog three uh, 
came from uh, uh, unrelated donor registries. Uh, WMDA uh, started that call. Donor actually typing uh, the, the, the conditions were that uh, donor must be, uh, first of all, new volunteers, volunteer between 2012-2018. And that is to have them sequence, type by sequencing, whether Sanger or mixed generation. And it is for the uh, antigen recognition domain, exons, for example, for exon, for class one typing must be exon two and three, and for class two must be exon two sequencing. A uh, condition was volunteers must be consecutive registrants, it's not sort of pick and choose. And all actually must be submitted, including those two ambiguities. This paper contains hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of information and it is all available at this website and i sincerely encourage everyone who is interested in looking at uh, distribution of allele frequencies in different populations different ethnicities to look at this for example if you are interested in enclosing spondylitis and uh, we know for example the be 2702 or 2705 are risk alleles for ankylosing spondylitis and you'd like to know the variability of these alleles in different populations and you want to relate it to the frequency or the uh, incidence of ankylosing spondylitis in different populations you can you can you can look at these data and you can use them you need the permission from uh, the the authors uh, of the paper and and then you can use this data and do analysis there are lots of things can be done with this data and this is just to show you very briefly what came in the paper in terms of uh, distribution of uh, actually at least into three frequency category common intermediate well documented at the two field uh, resolution and as you can see uh, <coughs> this is the p group uh, the common alleles for the a for example and the intermediate were about 100 alleles. Majority of the alleles were in the well-documented. What we mean by the well-documented, they have been detected one to four times, uh, those alleles. And that applies for actually B, actually C, DRB1, DRB3, majority of them in, in, in the uh, well-documented, DQB and DQB. When you look at the G group, you will see that the numbers in, in, in the first slide in hundreds, while here they are not that huge because G group sort of summon lots of alleles under the umbrella of the G group. And you'll see that majority of the alleles are in the common, less in the intermediate and less in the well-documented. And that applies to almost all. And the non-expressed alleles, the majority of those alleles were in the uh, not common, not well-documented, documented not intermediate group which is one to four occurrences uh, some of them you will see um, they were well documented which is about five or more occurrences but, but very very few of them in the well uh, in the common or intermediate or do well documented uh, group this table summarizes the data i just showed uh, for for the null alleles uh, how many are common in the HLAA, how many infrequent and well-documented or not common and well-documented, which is the majority. This is an image from the tables in the supplement, table one, and it just lists every single allele, known allele, uh, uh, discovered by the different groups. And it will tell you, for example, in the MENA region, we have common alleles, actually A01, 01, 01, 02, and you will see that these alleles were common among most sort of uh, ethnic groups. If you go down the list in the actually A1, you will see that, for example, there are many alleles well documented, but they are not in the, in the MENA group. And that has so many reasons. One of them, number of uh, uh, donors submitted, but also reflects the distribution of different alleles in different populations. I will show you more data on this on the Saudi population in a minute. And this again, the HLAB, for example, B702, is common in, in, in almost all ethnic groups. Uh, 
Uh, but when it comes to B703, we, were, we, we did not see it in, in our MENA group. Uh, 0704, it was well documented. Uh, but you see the rest of the B7 uh, group, they were well documented or intermediate for certain uh, population, uh, like here, for example, in the Europeans, but we don't see them in the MENA group. This table shows the uh, P uh, group uh, alleles. So in the uh, HLA IMGT database 3.31, there were for HLA 2800, uh, 2800 uh, alleles. Uh, number of alleles observed in this 8 million were 1500, which is almost 53%. And the number of common and well documented, intermediate well documented alleles were 673 out of all this 2,800, which is almost 23%. And this applies for the other sort of uh, uh, genes, actually A, B, C, D, R, B, D, Q, B, D, P, B as well. So what is the characteristics of this uh, common and uh, well-documented uh, catalog three? It is global where we have people coming from different parts of the world. It's very important. We have 8 million people represented in this paper. It is based on seven population groups, seven ethnic groups. And this gives you the opportunity uh, to go back and look at this data if you are interested and maybe you do more analysis from a different angle. There were more, about 15 million alleles observed in, in this 8 million people. Results available in A, B, C, D, R, B, 1, 4, 3, 4, 5, D, Q, B, D, B, B. Uh, the primary results at the P level, but the common category is a broader in definition. So in the past, in catalog two, it was one in a thousand called a common allele. Now we have a, a, a more sort of broader definition for common category, which is one in 10,000. And we have the introduction of the intermediate which is one in 100,000. And in, in, in this, uh, I'd like to stop here for a minute and say, uh, can you, for example, look at Arab population, uh, uh, people who published from different countries and uh, uh, they have sequencing data and it's already in the public domain. Can we start a sort of, uh, a catalog for the Arab people trying to collect more than 100,000 alleles, more, more than 50,000 individuals. I believe if you can do that, you can come up with a nice paper just to follow up from this catalog three. And as I said, data is available online through uh, the supplementary material, which is hundreds and hundreds of pages, as I said. It's a huge collection, a huge data available for people to look at. Uh, this is one of the tables from the paper, and it just compares the results of the uh, data from the 8 million people, the common well-documented alleles, comparing that to uh, catalog number two, to the FE common well-documented alleles, which follows the catalog two, and the Chinese, which, which is also following the catalog two. So just to compare uh, catalog two with catalog three, in catalog three, you have a total of 105, actually A alleles described as common, which is more than one in 10,000 occurrences. And compared to catalog two, where we have 63. For the world documented, we have 460 actually A alleles under the catalog three versus 169. For the group of uh, alleles that were detected less than five, which is one to four occurrences. In the catalog three, we found 55. In the catalog two, there were 496. And this applies to all genes, actually A, actually B, actually C, DQ, DP. I look at DP here, for example, we have 58 alleles in catalog three, versus 38 in catalog two in the common category. For the well-documented, we have 151 alleles in the uh, well-documented versus 11 in catalog two. And for the one to four uh, number of alleles, which is not, not common and well-documented, we have only one occurrence for DPB versus 210 in catalog two. 
saying that about the this is a huge study which consists of more than eight million people and if you have not read the paper i sincerely advise you to read it and download the supplementary material for it what we did we took another line and we thought what shall we do with our data i mean these are unrelated donors and we better find something out of that uh, so we collaborated with uh, Dr. Aytul Ayer in Turkey and uh, Karl Heinz Muller, you know our friend Karl Heinz Muller from the DKMS uh, who retired recently. I mean, he, he is a great asset, uh, Karl Heinz. We collaborated with, uh, with these groups and in, in the idea to look at our donors and try to make sense out of them in terms of the HLA typing. So we had complete typing by sequencing on 28,900, almost, almost 29,000 individuals, unrelated sequential volunteers. They were typed for A, B, C, D, R, B, 1, 3, 4, 5, DQB, DPB by sequencing. They are unrelated. They are Arabs in origin, Saudis, male and female, almost 50%, 50-50. And uh, the age group were between 18 to 60. As you know, for, for uh, registries, usually you would like to have donors with you for the longer period you can. Uh, so we try to put an age limit on our donors between 18 and 55 so they can stay with us on, on the registry for some time. So uh, this group, uh, they, they, some of them have been with us for some time now. Uh, we started 2011, uh, so the average age group was uh, 31 years. We looked at the uh, data and we did analysis by uh, Arlequin, uh, trying to look at three, five, and six local haplotypes, trying to determine the frequency of those haplotypes, identify the common haplotypes using the maximum likelihood maximization algorithm. We did pairwise linkage disequilibrium. And uh, I had an interest, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, tables that were produced by certain companies, uh, they show you the common uh, DRB1 and DQB1 uh, sort of associations, and uh, you have also the B and the C. So I had an interest in that, uh, just to see, is there something different in our population? Uh, and as you know, uh, as we type daily, and GS uh, results and report them, you see certain associations that are not there in the Western population. And you start to sort of note these uh, new associations and sometimes you're not sure, are they real, are they not? This table shows you the allele frequency and uh, I'm quoting the paper. I'm not putting everything from the paper because it's not out yet. But once it is out, everything I'm showing on the screen will be there for you to download, including the, uh, the, uh, the analysis data, two locus, three locus, five locus, six locus, haplotypes and their frequencies. It is for you to download and analyze and look at. Everything I show here will be available on the website. I received many calls to give copies of the paper. I said, please wait just for the paper to appear uh, online and then you will find it there. Everything is there. I did not hide anything. So by looking at the data, it's interesting that, uh, for example, for HLAA, uh, O2O1 is almost one in five, 20%. For HLA B51 B and B50 O1, uh, they have almost 30 or more than 30% of the uh, HLAB in the Saudi population. Interesting for HLAC, more than 50% of the alleles, they are either 06, 02, 07, 02, 04, 01, 15, 02. For DRB1, 07, 01, and 03, 01, they compromise almost 30% of the DRB1 alleles in, in the population. And we see it every day when we report our data and our patients and donors. Uh, for DQB, uh, we have DQ0201, 0302, and 0301. Again, um, more than 50%. And when it comes to DPB, 0401, 0201, 0301, 
they make about 60% of uh, the, the uh, actually the PP uh, alleles. It's interesting when you look at the null allele in this cohort, uh, and, and you take the definition of common well intermediate and uh, uh, well and, and well documented alleles, you see that uh, uh, null alleles are not common in the Saudi population, and uh, they they fall in the category of um, less than five uh, occurrences in, in the population, and they are not. They are the, under what we call not common, not well documented, and not intermediate uh, allele, except for the RB50110, which is occurred 12, per, 12 occurrences, which makes it uh, 2%, uh, sorry, 0.02%, which is a common allele in this case. This slide shows the something interesting about the haplotypes. These are calculated haplotypes. These are not family haplotypes. We did the sex locus haplotype frequency. And it is very interesting to note that there are haplotypes that span the period from actually A to DPB. And uh, this, is, this is very interesting. And we notice it in families as well, that the haplotypes and in homozygous people, that the haplotypes Types are fixed there for for majority of people. You don't see the, what we notice in the Western population, the Europeans, where you have a hotspot between DQB1 and DPB1. And we have the first haplotype A2, B, uh, C15, B51, DR4, DQ3, and DPB4, 1% of the population. The interesting thing that uh, sort of caught my, my attention is this haplotype number three, which is A2, C6, B50, DR7, DQ2, DP4. I call this haplotype the founder haplotype of the Arab population. And I'm happy to discuss this further later, but I'll show you some evidence. And uh, it is, it's interesting, in, in the Western population, they have what do they call A1, B8, DR3 haplotype. Uh, they call it the founding haplotype in uh, the Europeans. And that haplotype is associated with many diseases, especially autoimmune diseases. Uh, for you, uh, those who are interested, you may recall the associations that come with A1B8, DR3. But when it comes to the, this haplotype, we, we notice that there is this haplotype that comes from A2 to, DR, to DP4, but it also ha occurs without the flanking region, without the A2 here, you have A23 and DP3, but the C6B50, DR7, DQ2 is there. Another occurrence where instead of A201, we have O205, and DP as DP3 with A23, but the C6B50, DR7, DQ2 is there. And then we have A2, the same as number three, but without the DP4, we have DP14. And then again, we have another one with D, with A or two or five, but a different DP. If you take the C6B50 DR7 DQ2 as the haplotype and you add the frequencies, you get a very large number or a very high frequency of a haplotype in the population. This, this is from the Pipe Up uh, website, looking at B5001. It is interesting to note, by the way, that we, in a study that we did uh, in, in our lab, we looked at uh, B50 polymorphism. And interesting enough, in the Arab population, almost 99% of those with B50, they are B5001. You will not see any other allele. And if you, uh, I found uh, in one individual B5009, and when I looked at the, the family name, it was not a Saudi actually individual. And whenever I get something that is not B5001, I look at the family name. And uh, believe me, uh, most of the time, if not all, you will find that the, the surname is not a Saudi surname. So B50 is not polymorphic in, in the Arabs or at least in Saudis. And when you look at the distribution of actually B50, uh, this is an old slide before we reported our data. And if you put the 
Riyadh or uh, Central Saudi Arabia data on this, you'll see a very hot sort of circle in the middle of Saudi Arabia. The second one spans between the West Bank and uh, Jordan, and you can see sort of waves of migration of people. And actually, if you go to the right, it goes up to India, uh, going through Iran uh, and, and uh, uh, Pakistan and then India. And it goes up to Turkey and part of Italy. And the second hotspot, you find it between Morocco and Spain. And uh, you can see the waves of uh, spread of this B-50 allele and its distribution, which in a way reflects actually uh, the, the Arab uh, movement at the beginning of the Islamic uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the Islamic kingdoms or, or uh, Islamic uh, uh, dynasties. Uh, they, they started to go to India and then going into Turkey and then uh, going to Spain. So I believe B-50 is, is like an Arab, an Arab sort of uh, allele. And, and that is evidenced by what we see in our daily practice. Almost one in five of Saudi's type, you'll find the B-50 with that. This is DR-7. It's all over the place. But DR-7, which occurs on this haplotype, where you have B50 and DR7, DQ2, DP4. Uh, although it, it's everywhere, but you can see it's also spanning between Arabia and uh, Africa and some other uh, places. We looked at uh, DR, actually A to DQB as, as a haplotype. And the number one, comes up is A2, C6, B50, DR7, DQ2, almost 2%. And uh, with A205, the same haplotype, 1.6%. And again, we have A23, C6, the same sort of uh, part of the haplotype at 1.2%. Uh, I, I saw this haplotype and I thought at the beginning, A26, C7, B8, DR3, DQ2. I thought this is the European haplotype without the A1. But then I realized it's not the C701, it's C702. Uh, nevertheless, this haplotype that is DR3 based haplotype seemed to be a common haplotype in the Arab population. This is the European founding haplotype, which I told you is called A1, B8, DR3, and it is A101, C701 in our Arabian population. It's C702. And it goes with B8, DR3, uh, and, and DQ2. So from B8 to DQ2, it's the same as what we see with the, uh, with the haplotype in Saudi Arabia. The difference comes with A26 and C702. You rarely will see this haplotype in an Arab. I have not seen something like this in Saudi Arabia, actually. I never, I never encountered any Arab with this haplotype or A1. C7, D8, DR3, DQ2. If you look at the frequency, this is very frequent haplotype in Europeans. And when you look at this haplotype in Saudis, it is, it's about 1.5%, but it is part of that haplotype. One of the attempts that we try to uh, go for is to look at the uh, HLA, B, and C associations. And as I told you, as you report data every day, we notice that there are certain associations we don't see from uh, these uh, associations that the companies give you as a mouse pad or as a, as a figure you put in your uh, office. And um, for example, in, in the Saudi population, and this is part of the table, you'll find the full table in the publication. We have the full list of HLAB and, and their association with HLAC. So for example, HLAB 51, was very commonly seen with C1502, 1402, rarely seen with 0302 or 602. B50, most of the time you'll find it with C602, but you, you see it also with C701, and rarely, and rare occasions you see it with C1203 and 1502. And the same applies for other HLAB. We did the same for DQ, and um, we noticed, for example, DR1, it goes with DQB 0501, 0504, rarely with 0503. 
or two was or five or one and rarely one or six or two. Uh, DR3 is one of uh, the the uh, types that seem to go with so many different HLA DQ. Uh, commonly, you see it with DQ02 uh, with O5 or two as well. It's common. Rarely you see it with O5 or one and O3 uh, or one, but we see it with other associations as well. Uh, we see DRB O3 O2 with DQB O4 O2, which is similar to what you see in the uh, Europeans. And whenever you find DRB O3 O2, you find it with DQ O4 O2. Again, the full list of uh, DR can be found in the paper, and uh, the raw data actually is there as well. So when we looked at the common well-documented alleles, we found that we don't have intermediate alleles because our population is less than 50,000. The definition of intermediate is more than or equal to one in 100,000. That means you need more than 50,000 individuals to make that category uh, uh, in, in, your, in your analysis. So um, we found mostly common alleles, very rarely well documented, but the common and well documented, they account for about 60% for most local loci that we have, actually A, B, C, D, R, B1, DQB1, DPB1, almost 60%. Uh, the non-common, non-intermediate, non-documented uh, alleles, uh, they are in the region of 30 to 40%. I told you uh, the title of my paper is uh, to use this common well-documented allele to sort out ambiguities. One of the ambiguity, I'll give you two or three examples of the ambiguities that we face. And this is inherent in the problem, in the, in the technology itself. As you know, when we do NGS, for majority of uh, technology available, uh, uh, except for the long reads, you do a small fragment sequencing and then the computer software will try to reassemble and sort out the two alleles. And if you have two polymorphisms far away from each other, sometimes it's difficult to uh, uh, tell whether uh, it is cis or trans, and that comes up with ambiguity. So the first example is something that we face almost every day, uh, B5801 with B5801, or it can be B5317, or and B5808. So what uh, we do, we look at the frequency and uh, for the 5001 and 5801, they are relatively common as alleles in the population. While the other combination, we don't see it in 30,000 individuals. So that is the first step in the analysis. Then we, what we do, we look at the table of uh, B and C associations. And we found out that B5201, for example, goes with C12, which is the C typing of the individual. And then C302 goes with B5001. And, and there is no association because there are 0% of the other two alleles. Having this association from the table that I showed you here, by looking at the associations, can help you a lot in sorting out your ambiguities which you will face. There's no way that you will not face these ambiguities. Uh, and and uh, there is a website actually, uh, which is uh, part of the HLA uh, catalog uh, 3.41. Uh, I uh, was released 13th of July, 2020. This is the link. Actually you can download that uh, catalog of ambiguous uh, typing. And for our our uh, type here, B52 and B5801, uh, and it's being ambiguous with 5317, you will see it as one of the combination in that table. Uh, if you download it from this link, if you see that it, the, the, it can be, uh, uh, when you sequence it, the full sequence is still due to cis trans, you cannot distinguish B5001 and 5801. 801, and you cannot distinguish it from 5317, Another example is 3501, 5101, or it could be 5301 and 7801, 
the patient in this case, uh, his HLAC was 1502 and 1604. When we look at the frequency of 3501 plus 2.8%, 5101 uh, almost 20%, and the second combination, 5301, 3.9, and 7802 is 0.2%. So based on frequencies, you would uh, favor the, the, the first uh, combination. But then we look at the association table, and uh, as I said, you will find in, included in the paper, you can download the supplement table that will have all these associ calculated associations. So C1502 goes with 5101, uh, uh, it occurred 5,600 times, and the, the occurrence, the linkage equilibrium between these two, the haplotype is 9.8%. C1604 is associated with actually uh, 3501, not 5101, and it occurs in 1% of the population. And there was no association between the C type and this combination, 5301, 7801 at all. And again, if you go to the uh, ambiguity uh, table from this location, you will find that B35, 01 and 5101, they are in, uh, when they occur, they, they, they cannot be distinguished from 5301 and 7802. And this is what we were talking about cis and trans between two polymorphisms far away from each other that cannot be uh, sort of sorted when it comes to reassembling the, the different the smaller fragments. Uh, another example uh, A205 and uh, uh, A2022, or it cannot dist be distinguished from A2102 and A2382. So um, the frequency of the above is 4% and 0.2%. The frequency of the below is zero and zero. But then we have the three locus association and we look at A, C, and B associations and we find that A205 with C602 and B5001 occurs in 2.3%. And you can see the uh, associations here. And same for A222 goes with C302 and B5801, which, is, which occurs in this patient. And this is the frequency of this haplotype. So when we face ambiguities in my lab, what we do, if the family is present and we can sort it out, we use the family to, to us sign the alleles. If no family or cannot be sorted by the family, uh, we do the, we look at the allele frequency and, and you will have the full allele frequency in our paper in Frontiers in Immunology. And then we look at linkage disequilibrium between C and B or A and C and B and DR and DQ. And what we, we report the, the frequent or the one uh, combination that seems to be found in our population, but we say the others cannot be excluded. What is the solution? The solution, the ideal solution is to use a single molecule real-time sequencing, SMART, that covers in one go the full gene, class one or class two. In this case, there is no cis or trans problem. But until then, uh, I was going to talk about this, but I will leave it. Uh, you'll find it in the paper, this figure. It's about uh, probability of finding a donor, full match donor for a patient based on that. So in conclusion, I'd like to conclude my uh, lecture. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the common well-documented intermediate alleles uh, catalog is very useful for day-to-day -day practice. I sincerely encourage everyone to look at the paper and try to download the tables. Uh, just to give you an idea if, about your ethnic group and which alleles are common, which alleles are not seen even in huge data sets. Some of the populations actually, they have one million individuals in the analysis, some of the ethnic groups. Uh, different ethnic groups, they have different uh, common and well-documented alleles. Having this data uh, from your population can help you sorting out uh, typing ambiguities, etc. At the end, I would like to thank you for your time and uh, for being uh, with us at this time of night or day. I'd like to acknowledge uh, from uh, the, the work that we have done, Dr. Dunya Jaudat, uh, Dr. Aytul Oyer, Dr. Ahmed Al-Askar, Karl-Heinz Muller, Nazir Sira, 
I would like to acknowledge my lab staff, Hanan Al Anizi, Abdullah Shpeli, Muhammad Al Zahrani, Faisal Oufi, Aisha Al Anizi, Afnan Al Qasim, Asma Al Blahid, Farah Al Shiban, Farah Al Sibihan, Muhammad Al Ghamdi, Abdullah Al Rashid. Shukran Jazeelan. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Ali, for the wonderful talk. And wonderful talk. And also, I appreciate uh, and I will. I like how you summarize and highlight uh, the roadmap of the common and well documented in all for all of us in the NGS or next generation era, and how to improve it uh, worldwide, and how to focus and how you focus in the Arab population, especially in the MENA region, and um, and also. Uh, what is important is uh, for us is how it is um, what is common in certain population which is only exposed and what is not uh, not we don't see it in our population. There is one question from Aziz: um, uh, If everyone is getting a haplotype and allele from the parent, what would be the mechanism of each allele diversity? Okay, if everyone is getting a haplotype and alleles from the parents, what would be the mechanism of HLA allele diversity? Abir Madbouli, huh? Abir Madbouli, the Salat Sual. Aziz. Abir Madbouli, the Salat. Aziz, Aziz, Chen. Aziz? Ah. And two feet. Yes, yes. Yeah, naturally. So, Lani. Yes, people, they get haplotypes from their parents. But, of course, actually, diversity did not occur over 100 years or 200 years. I believe human beings. I've been on Earth for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and uh, allele diversity comes from two major uh, sort of uh, 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 areas. One is uh, recombination, uh, where you have recombination between different uh, uh, loci, and the other comes from allele duplication, gene duplication. Uh, the mutations within the gene, but doesn't occur between in, in one generation. So diversity for HLA happened over so many tens of thousands of years. It's not uh, a generation uh, sort of uh, a result of one generation or two. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that answered the question. There is a question from Ashraf Dada. Dr. Ashraf, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reem. And uh, allow me to thank the Arshi for organizing uh, such a webinar. And uh, I want to thank also Dr. Ali Hajir for this uh, really excellent and distinguished presentation. And in the same time, congratulate him and his team for this uh, pioneer work in the Arab uh, region. Uh, my question is uh, the data of this about 30,000 uh, individuals. Are they real Zaudi or maybe they are mixed of uh, foreigners, uh, the ethnicity of these individuals who are living in Saudi Arabia? Uh, this is the first question. Yeah, they, are, the they are Arab, Saudi Arabs actually. They are, they are Saudi Arabs because one of our our. Well, uh, Dr. Ashraf, one of our uh, sort of uh, uh, conditions for the uh, registry is to have people who are resident of the country. Uh, because if you take uh, someone who is uh, not going to stay for long in, uh, in the country, most probably they, they will not be around when they are needed, most probably in five, ten years, for example. So we try to collect only Saudis in, in this and we do donor drives based on patients. The other day we had a lady from Khatif area. She has the only child who needed uh, transplantation. We couldn't find the donor for him in our uh, collection. 
So what we did, we asked her to help us uh, organize a donor drive in Qatif. And يعني, thanks to Qatif uh, people, they more than 2,000 people actually volunteered and they gave them. So uh, we, we have donor drive based on patient need and we go and out to villages and cities and universities where almost 100% of the students are Saudis. We focus on, on students actually at universities. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, please, and I, have a, I have a second question, a quick question. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, th these data are only from the, res re the registry, BMT registry of National Guard Hospital, or you have data of other registry, for example, King Faisal Hospital or some else. Yeah, thank you. If, if you see on this, uh, this slide, uh, the, the cohort of uh, donors we collected from the Saudi stem cell donor registry, which is part of National Guard uh, Hospital only. Okay, thank you very much, Trali. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a question here, uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Excellent presentation. Regarding NGS, how often did you face this trans ambiguity? Daily. Daily. And this is part of the uh, technology. It's not something that you can do anything about it. You do the analysis. You check your... Uh, your uh, uh, sort of uh, results and uh, backgrounds and you reanalyze and, analyze and, and they will not go away. Uh, simply because uh, if you go to this link, you'll download, there are a huge collection of uh, these combinations that uh, by, by nature of the uh, occurrence of the polymorphism. So for example, you have and, and uh, a point imitation in exon 2 that determines 3501, but at the same time you have another one in exon, let's say, 5. And these two polymorphisms are far away from each other. They, they will have to be cis trans. No matter what you do, as long as you do a 100, 200 uh, sort of fragment analysis, you will have to have this, this ambiguity coming. So we face it daily, actually. Because when you have these two, for example, B3501 and B5101, when you have them as a combination, you cannot distinguish them. It will come up with ambiguity B53, B78. And uh, this is due to the uh, frequency of these two alleles in our population. Dr. Reem, you are muted. Dr. Reem, you're muted. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ali. There is a question from Dr. Rabab Al Atas, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Reem, and thank you, Dr. Ali, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. And uh, let me congratulate you and your team for this uh, um, uh, excellent work. Uh, my question, maybe I, I have missed the first part because I joined uh, after a few minutes. Um, your cohort have been uh, tested, uh, I believe, over a certain period of time. Uh, so it went through different generation of sequencing. And uh, this may contribute to this uh, cis ambiguity because I believe now the next generation sequencing, we rarely have this cis and uh, actually we don't have to have this cis and uh, uh, trans ambiguities. Uh, so uh, am I right that your cohort have been started uh, uh, DC or A205 with, DC or two or five with or, uh, or 222 do you see them in your population? How they combine? Yeah, with the next generation. O205 and O222. Well, that's yes. my question. Have you seen this with the next generation sequencing or during the... This is next generation. This is next... No, no, no. This is next generation sequencing the full gene. Uh-huh. No, this is yes, sequencing. When you have two, uh, two alleles, as I said yani, earlier, when you have two alleles that are, uh, two uh, mutations that are far away from each other, 
using the 100 or no matter whether you're using Illumina or Ion Torrent, using the fragments that are 100, 200 base pair, you must have these ambiguities. It's part of, it's an inherent problem within the technology. So when you have common alleles like O2, O5, when they come together, or when you have B35 and B51, you must have B53, B78 coming up as, as um, ambiguity. Oh, so um, uh, actually we have only short experience and we haven't encountered so far any ambiguities in the transcendences. Uh, so, but my question, um, your cohort have been studied during how long period? And they are, uh, they were uh, tested by the same uh, next generation sequencing, all of them? Hello. These ambiguities that I'm showing here, they are tested by uh, the whole sequencing, yani. Hey, Baba. Can you can, mm. can you switch your microphone? We are hearing you. I don't know who you are. No, Muhammad Rafaf. Muhammad Rafaf. Can you switch your microphone, please? Off. <laughs> I just muted. So we, get, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ali. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noor. Uh, Dr. Rabab, these ambiguities I'm showing here, uh, B3551, and uh, this one, uh, this is our daily practice. And, um, actually, what we do, we do big number of sequencing every week. And uh, we, we try to do our uh, re relations and donor by next generation. We do our... Uh, and both of us, we do it by NGS. So we, we notice this yeah, almost every run, you will see one case where you have this ambiguity coming up. I'm happy uh, for people to come and visit us, and uh, uh, we can discuss this. And uh, actually, what we do now when we before we report any NGS result. We must go, our staff, they are very well trained in this. They, they must go and do the association studies. So for example, we see in our population when it comes to DR, let's say 1501, 1601, our association with DQ, they are different to what you see in the European population. We have our associations and we go through them, uh, DQA with DQB, we go through DR and DQ, we go through DQ and DP, we go through the B and the C. So before we report any single report for NGS, we have, it's, it's part of the criteria of the analysis that you must do the associations. Because sometimes, uh, and this is how you discover if you have uh, loss of heterozygosity or loss of uh, allele, allele uh, uh, dropout, uh, you found you find an allele, and usually this goes with this allele. So why you only find the DR but you don't find the DQ? Uh, so we asked ourselves these questions before we go ahead and, and verify our data. We do this full association study. We were going to run a workshop with uh, the help of Arshi. I hope we can do it uh, in person, but if not, I'm happy to do it online just how you verify and confirm your typing before you report it for the NGS. Dr. Rabab? Yes, you can ask a question. Yes, yes, sir. There is, um... Yes, thank you, Dr. Ali, but uh, um, any, um, for me, I mean, as long as the ambiguity is one is well, uh, common and the other is very rare, this is not a... Uh, and that's what we usually, we practice. Uh, I'm just... Ma ma I've Allah. never seen it, the O2, O5 and O2, 22 or O2 uh, with the NGS and the other one... Dr. Rabab, you can send us... Yes, Doctora, Reem, sorry. Yeah, the, the voice is uh, interrupted in the first uh, 
the first few seconds? No, I just said that it is interesting, I mean, to, to look at this ambiguities, I mean, because we haven't really encountered such ambiguities, uh, or maybe it's not so common, uh, the A205 and... Uh, oh, and the Eastern population, population, we looked at it. And as, as long as the, uh, we have one is common and we, the other one is rare, this is okay, fair enough, and it is excluded by the being very far uh, in terms of frequency. Yes. But the thing that uh, I might, yes. it would be of interest for us to test this sample with our NGS if we can have such an uh, ambiguity as well. Yes, yes, please. Uh, Dr. Ali, question here. Um, with this, uh, first, congratulations for this tremendous data that you're putting for the region. Um, I think this is well needed. And, and this kind of data, uh, do you think we could leverage um, uh, NGS power uh, on typing deceased donors so we could have a regional CPRA calculation? I'm working on something like this now, actually. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> I'm working on this now to try to uh, put together a CPRA uh, for, for cadavers. Because most of our cadavers are not really Saudis. That's the problem. And uh, they come from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, different, different, uh, uh, completely different backgrounds uh, Filipinos, Indians, Bangladeshis, uh, Pakistanis. So uh, doing a calculated PRA on them is, is, uh, is something difficult, but we are working on, on, on establishing something soon, inshallah. That's very helpful because for, I remember back in the days when I was involved, uh, we were using the American and the Canadian CPRA, which do not reflect the population. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's difficult. Okay, I think we are on the top of the hour here. Uh, do we have any more? Yeah. Yes, I think that's it. Um, there's, there's any, any more questions? Uh, there is no more question on the chat. Uh, somebody okay. want to make a comment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. No comments? Yeah, I think it's, uh, we might uh, want to conclude the session and thank you very much, uh, Professor Hajir, for uh, the wonderful talk and, um, and highlighting thank the limitations you. Thank in you. our thank area. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Reen. Thank you, Noor. Uh, thank you, Fadi. Thank you, everyone, Dr. Dunya, for uh, organizing this uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in the Sorry. next presentation coming. You're welcome. Inshallah.